This is Phil Collins here, and though some of you might know me from my music, I'm talking to you today just as an Alamo enthusiast. The model you see displayed here was made by Mark Lemon and photographed for his recent book. I bought the model from him because I felt that it should be seen by visitors to the Alamo, so they could get an idea of how it looked in 1836. It shows, as much as it's possible to know, just how big the area was and the problems the Texian defenders would have faced trying to defend this large compound against Santa Ana's forces. When visiting the Alamo, I'm sure that some of you are a little confused by what you see, as there are only certain buildings left standing. Some people may even leave San Antonio thinking that the church was the Alamo because that's become the iconic image of the place. Fortunately, though, some of the long barracks, where so much of the last bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting took place, is still with us. However, it's hard to imagine what it really looked like when you're standing out there on the plaza, as so much of this glorious place is gone now. There are so many unknown aspects regarding the Siege of the Alamo. I mean, incredible as it may sound, even today no one can agree on how many defenders there actually were. Numbers range from 185 to over 200. Whatever the number was, it was a mostly untrained collection of enthusiastic patriots. They didn't even have enough men to properly man all the cannons they had. No one can agree either on how big the Mexican army was or the number of casualties they suffered. It's often said that in the famous Battle of Thermopylae when 300 Spartans defended their honor against the huge Persian army, there was at least one survivor to retell the tale. The Alamo had none. The only survivors were non-combatants who saw little, if anything, of the battle. So it's up to us and the many Alamo historians to speculate on what happened. The daughters of the Republic of Texas over the years have made huge efforts to retain the integrity and historical importance of the Alamo. But despite that, too much has been lost to get any kind of real idea of the way it was. This model will hopefully give you a glimpse into the past. Santa Ana arrived with troops in San Antonio on February 23, 1836, and laid siege to the Alamo, limiting the defenders' food, supplies, and communication. In the following days, the Mexican army continued to grow. On learning that Texan reinforcements were not coming, the defenders sensed gloom. Adding to this, the haunting notes of the Diguero echoed across the plains, signaling that the Mexican army would take no prisoners alive. During the several months preceding the Battle of the Alamo, its defenders worked hard to transform this large mission into a fort, strengthening walls, filling windows, and positioning artillery. The structure just outside the compound and south of the west wall was the Charlie House. This belonged to Pedro Charlie, one of the original inhabitants of the mission who operated a small carpentry shop in the southwest corner of the quadrangle. Nearby was an earthwork and palisade enclosure called a lunette, which protected the main gateway to the Alamo. Here, two mounted cannons protected a large double door for mounted traffic and a small pedestrian yard. These gates were part of the low barracks and opened onto the Alamo Plaza, where the cenotaph monument to the defenders now stands. The first room to the right of the main gate within the low barracks was the small room used by Colonel James Bowie after he became ill during the siege. His cot inside this darkened room could be brought outside to gain fresh air. The northern extension on the east end of the low barracks served as the kitchen for the garrison. On the reinforced ramp and platform in the southwestern corner of the Alamo Plaza was the largest cannon in the fort's inventory, the 18 pounder. It was manned by the New Orleans Greys, and Travis fired this cannon in reply to Santa Ana's offer of surrender at discretion. Adjacent to it, where Pedro Charlie had his carpentry shop, was the post's blacksmith shop, and the structure next to this was the artillery command post. Just north, along the west wall, was the site of the Alamo's gun aid, which was also manned by some of the New Orleans Greys. This large cannon was devastating at close range. Midway down the west wall is a gabled structure that was once the Dredinio House, 
and during the siege, this site served as Colonel Travis's command centre and headquarters. Here, Travis prepared and planned for the battle. The next house northward along the west wall was the southern Castaneda house. The northern room of the house was in ruins and was converted into a gun position which fired through an open window to the west. The northwest corner of the compound contained the northern Castaneda house, which had been covered over and reinforced for use as a heavy gun position. Equipped with one cannon firing to the west and another firing north, it was one of the main defensive positions for these two walls, and was called El Fortín de Condé. Just west of here was the fort's weakest point, where wooden beams reinforced the partially ruined wall. Farther east along the north wall was another fortified gun position called El Fortín de Terán, which was under the direct command of Colonel Travis. Mounted here were three cannons, all firing north. The wall continued eastward past the remains of the Reyes house. From the northeast corner of the compound, it ran south along a group of huts called Hercales and ended in a small gate opening to the east. Beyond the gate was the mission's large granary, previously used for storing foodstuffs. In 1836, it was converted into the long barracks for housing soldiers. The Sanchez Navarro map described trenches dug lengthwise inside the building to aid the defenders' last ditch stand. At the southern end of the long barracks was the two-storey convento, which had housed priests during the mission period. By 1836, the lower rooms were used as an arsenal to house many of the fort's weapons, while the upstairs level served as a hospital. The convento courtyard was divided into two portions, one which contained the main well for the album, and a small area which contained the fort's latrines. A small cannon was placed in the northeastern corner. South of the convento, in front of the mission church, was the southern courtyard. A palisade extended from the corner of the church to the low barracks with a centrally placed cannon. This was the area defended by David Crocker and his Tennessee volunteers. A ditch was dug outside the palisade beyond which felled trees were dragged and stacked together to form an abartine. This device hindered direct attack of the palisade, forcing the enemy to negotiate a tangle of tree branches while leaving them vulnerable to the Tennessee sharpshooters. The church itself was mostly roofless. Inside, a long earthen ramp led to a gun position on the back wall, called El Fortín de Cos. Three cannons were placed here, all firing to the east. The church's inner rooms were considered the safest, and therefore provided sanctuary for the women and children during the battle. After 13 days of siege warfare and relentless shelling, the Mexican troops were assembled for the main attack early on the morning of March 6, 1836. General Santa Ana ordered his assault troops to form four columns. Grenadier and scouting, or cazadores companies, were supplied with six rounds of ammunition per man, while the line companies were only issued four rounds. Each man was given two extra flints for his musket. At about 5 a.m., the order was given to advance. The fourth column of Casadores moved forward, some soldiers taking refuge behind the Charlie House. Many of the men carried scaling ladders. After days of little or no sleep at all, most of the defenders were resting, as the night had been a quiet one. Once the Texans realised that they were under attack from the south, they scrambled to their feet, grabbed their weapons and opened fire on the enemy. The first and second columns attacked the defenders on the north wall. The assault was repulsed with heavy casualties but was quickly renewed. The third column attacked from the northeast. Because of the heavy opposition and little success, the third column shifted its assault to join the first and second columns outside the north wall. The combined forces called for additional support and Santa Ana's reserves joined them for that final assault. The Mexican troops eventually secured a foothold on the dilapidated north wall. Breaking through the weakened area, they crawled over the bodies of their dead and wounded comrades and poured into the Alamo complex. It was here, at El Fortín de Tirán, that Travis fell. Meanwhile, at the south wall, the fourth column was able to scale the wall and break through an area west of the low barracks. Realising that they had lost control of the quadrangle, the defenders took refuge in many of the buildings, including the long barracks and conventor. 
Here, heavy fighting developed, and the Mexican turned the Texan cannons to blast down the various doors. But in doing so, they killed many of their own men in the confused and smoke-filled early morning. The Long Barracks was the scene of some of the most vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat. Making good Santa Ana's promise that no one will be spared, the Mexican soldiers hunted down and killed every defender. This extended to James Bowie, whose dead body was found in a small room in the Low Barracks and to the wounded, who continued to resist when the Mexican troops entered the hospital. Atop the convento, the Texan flag continued to fly, and a number of Mexican troops were killed trying to remove it. Finally, Lieutenant Jose Maria Torres charged the position, took down the defender's flag, and replaced it with his unit's colors. He was then struck down by a Texan group. Lieutenant Torres is one of the many Mexican heroes that died that day. One of the last areas to fall was the palisade in front of the church. Here, after close hand-to-hand -hand fighting, Crockett and his volunteers were overrun. Crockett may well have died here, although this will be forever debated among historians. With the last defenders killed, only the women, children and slaves who had taken refuge in the sacristy were spared. Dawn rose and the black pall of smoke lifted over the battered and bloodied fortress. All resistance had ceased. As word spread of the fall of the Alamo, anger and outrage grew stronger in the hearts of other Texans. Following the massacre at Goliath three weeks later, where hundreds of Texans were executed, Houston's army was seething with rage and ready to fight. On April the 21st, an 18-minute battle on the plains of San Jacinto assured the survival of the Republic of Texas through the complete defeat of Santa Ana and his army. The cry would echo down through the ages. Remember the Alamo.